Let's talk about what life beyond our current structures and the outdated ways of thinking that come with them would look like. The conclusion that we should get rid of money may seem like a radical one on the surface considering its prevalence in our lives today. But if you understand systems and the way they interact with each other, you'll see that it's the most rational one. As a collective, we need to begin to understand that no two things are separate. Everything affects everything. And when you view the monetary system through this lens, it becomes easy to see why it's ineffective and unsustainable. Let's look at homelessness, for example. People aren't homeless because they're lazy or drug addicts. In fact, about half of them are employed. It's not because of the Democrats or Republicans. It's because they can't buy a home. There are more vacant homes than homeless people in America. And the only barrier standing in between them is an imaginary number in their bank account. But let's go deeper. Why can't this person afford a home? Maybe they're a veteran whose country didn't take care of them when they returned. Maybe their employer had to downsize and they were on the unlucky list. Maybe their child needed a life-saving operation and they couldn't afford it so they had to cash in everything they owned in order to pay for it. Or let's just say for the sake of argument, they're a degenerate junkie. Why'd they turn out that way? Well, maybe they came from poverty and lived in a single parent household and their family had to sell drugs just to make ends meet. And drugs were the only way they could cope with living in the hellscape of poverty. These are the type of thought processes that systemic thinking entails. And when deducing how a problem occurs, nine times out of 10, it will eventually root back to money. So after concluding that money seems to be the common denominator in every issue we have, the most reasonable course of action would be to figure out how we can function optimally without money. And that rabbit hole is endless. You see, one of the things that the monetary system hinders is technological progression and in turn, human progression. Like one of the pioneers of this movement, Jacques Fresco said, the question isn't whether we have the money, it's whether we have the resources. Imagine the things we could accomplish if we allowed technological and human ingenuity to move freely without the need to be limited by a budget. Once the proper technology is in place, we can provide everyone with everything they need simply by using the resources at our disposal at no quote unquote cost to us. One of the more commonly expressed means in which this can be achieved is a resource-based economy, which would seek to employ science in determining how to meet the needs of people rather than allowing the market god to determine who's worthy of surviving or not. And like I addressed in the last video, this is not a new concept to humans. Money is the new concept. In fact, there are many indigenous and Amazonian tribes who operate to this day without using money. They just help each other. The old world is ending. And we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the systemic problems in our world. And the real solutions we have today. To transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse. To create an abundantly advanced collaborative society. That sustains all life. You may think it's an impossible dream. But the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Matt Holton. Amanda Smith. And Zachary Marlowe. And together, we can move past this economic absurdity and come together to actualize our collective potential to create something completely new. We are Mindless Society. Okay, we're live. Welcome to the show. Uh, fuck, that's a stupid intro. If I was listening to a podcast, I would immediately turn it off. <laughs> Okay, hang on. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. I gotta, I gotta get into the, I gotta get possessed by the spirit of all past revolutionaries, <laughs> <laughs> and let them possess me and speak through me, so my petty ego and frail understanding of reality isn't, isn't mangling the, the, the hard truth of rebel of the science of revolution. Okay. All right. I'm juiced. I'm going. All right. Dual power. That is the topic of today's show. Building the new in the shell of the old. A kind of revolution that doesn't look at revolution like we all get together and push the bus over or we all seize the means of production go take over the amazon fulfillment center and turn it into a flower shop or whatever people think that means revolution we are here to talk about creating a new system that makes the old system obsolete 
a system conflict, a clash of worldviews, of ways of producing, of living, of coming together and creating something that truly is of us, that is our system that we live in, creating our own escape pod from the existing system as a, a new system entirely to build our way out. So today we have two amazing guests. Uh, I'd like to introduce everybody who isn't familiar already with our, our superstar on TikTok, Ron, Ron Wolf, the one and only. He's joining us for the first time in the show. Matt and Amanda have been both taken out by snipers, I think. We're not really sure yet. Um, <laughs> some kind of three-letter organization popped them off. Most likely. Uh, and we have, we have Demetrius from one of my favorite groups out there, Black Socialists in America. A uh, little sidebar about BSA. Uh, early in my uh, ideological radicalization, because I've always been a radical dude, just not ideologically, politically. I got involved in Twitter through the 2016 election and and I very quickly moved through all the different factions and all the people and learned, oh, okay, you have these people with this ideology and they're saying this thing and yelling about this and that. And uh, of all the groups that I found, of all the pages and people out there talking the talk and talking about solutions, you know, trying to actually do something about it, not just complaining on Twitter, BSA was one of the first that stood out to me that just always spoke nothing but truths that I always agreed with, always aligned with, and in being able to connect with them over the years and, you know, see them develop in, in a parallel fashion, developing our own systems, our own ideas, there's just very few people out there that I feel more aligned with. So Demetrius reached out, I was very overjoyed for that, and um, wanted to collab, so here we are. So Demetrius, why don't you tell us a little bit about BSA and, and um, let's, let's chop it up, let's get into dual power. First of all, Zachary, thank you so much for um, having me on. Um, I'm a big fan of Moneyless Society, um, the show. I fo started following it right from the beginning when you guys started doing the podcast. I was like, Moneyless Society, like, hell yeah, this seems dope. And uh, I just started listening and I was like, holy shit, like, <laughs> like this is this is this is the real deal. And, and especially uh, you as a personality and your you these just these like epic rants <laughs> which are just wonderful <laughs> um wonderful very inspiring uh, uh rants so I, I i'm a big fan of moneyless society so i started following you guys <clears throat> but yeah i'm a member of bsa black socials in america we are a um a, uh, I guess you could say a revolutionary uh, black socialist organization that started in 2018. It was originally started because um, we, uh, you know, we essentially feel like that, that um, talking about black politics from a radical revolutionary um, perspective, socialist perspective was kind of waning at the time. So that's why the organization uh, started. And so, just a little bit about us. We are a, um, we're all black, of course. We're internationalists. We're anti-authoritarian. We are eco-socialists and social ecologists. Um, I know you guys have a love of Uncle Uncle Bookchin uh, on this uh, podcast, and so do we. Um, and yeah, anti-imperialists, all, all all the good stuff. And so yeah, we believe that um, people should organize to uh, have control over the means of production um, in, in their society and just in general people having control over their labor land and in a, in a directly democratic fashion um in in a, in a way that will really bring about an institute freedom and, and and liberty and i can get more specific into like our strategy and dual power and stuff like that so yeah there's just a little bit a little bit about us ron why don't you introduce yourself too Hey, how's it going, everybody? Um, yeah, like Zach saying, I'm Ron. Uh, put me in charge of TikTok. I reached out um, probably if, um, about a half a year ago now, I would think. Um, yeah, these guys have been great to me. Um, but yeah, I'm Ron. There's not much to my story um, as far as accolades and uh, accomplishments go. But yeah, I'm just a, a radical dude <laughs> looking for radical solutions to this radical fucking hellscape we've been uh, born into. It uh, desperately needs reversing. And that's kind of what I've dedicated uh, my energy towards, you know. Um, let's say, oh, my screen just went out, sorry. Yeah, um... It's going to take a reversal in uh, mindset and attitudes and 
you know, you got to be the example, the old cliche, be the change you want to see in the world. So I try to live by that and just live my life accordingly, you know. So one of the uh, sort of mantras that we've come uh, come to at Money of the Society is build the change you want to see in the world. And I think that really epitomizes, you know, that essence of dual power, of prefiguration, of creating something, of not just saying we need to do this or laying out some broad, you know, hypothetical, ideal political platform of what we want to do, you know, with these visions of, of um, you know, the workers owning the means of production or whether it's the design science sort of side of these, you know, uh, circular cities, these, you know, ecological, um, you know, earthscapes, you know, it, it's about getting our hands on our own lives again. It's about getting back into control, democratic control, direct ownership, shared ownership of the means by which life is made, you know, on a daily basis. So I think it's very strange to me and it's very refreshing, you know, to connect with people with groups like BSA that are are, are very small minority even in the revolutionary click. And there are so many subcultures and you know factions and groups of people out there talking about this big war this big r revolution you know as 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 there are people talking about some big c collapse like society is just going to tip over and fall and we're all going to be living in mad max when in reality uh, as great san andrew said uh, on one of his videos you know or on twitter or something collapse is a process it's it's occurring right now you know uh, black people have been experiencing what we'd call collapse for hundreds of years. You know, they've been living in compromised, p- polluted, you know, positions that have directly endangered their lives for years. There has there's been a collapse of a social structure for years, and in the same way, revolution has been happening. You know, for as long as oppression has existed, we have been in this shared communal struggle uh, against the forces that oppress us. And constrain us into this alien and artificial, fragmented, you know, hierarchical compartmentalization of what we are. Um, but also, we've been working toward this greater humanity, this greater uh, liberation. You know, to shake off the shackles and run free. And so, it's weird that more people aren't talking about okay, what can we do today? What can we get our hands on and create as far as a social structure, as far as getting control of the, our workplaces as far as putting a roof over our heads you know you have so many people in the charity circle that will feed people or will try to get you know habitat for humanity will build houses for people but we're, we're not talking these people are not talking about creating permanent structures permanent culture permanent you know social technology or social infrastructure to perpetually house people to create not just scratch the itch or you know solve the symptom, but actually work to create something creative. I keep saying this to people. We don't just need to resist, and we certainly can't consume our way out of this, because I know so many people out there know that the problems in the world are wrong. They know that what we're doing is unsustainable, and they'll try to consume differently, or they'll try to recycle things more. And I I think those are all good things, but we can't consume our way out of this crisis. We have to create our way out. Absolutely. I, I, I totally um I totally agree. And that's something that we talk about um in BSA often, and there's something that we preach in BSA often is what can uh poor and working class people do right now to start building the next system, right? No longer waiting on uh, you know, the 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 vanguard or the glorious party or um, you know, this the fucking state or or whomever to try to, you know, solve your problems. How can we begin to take back our own autonomy and our own freedom and liberty and start building uh the next system? So I think maybe from here we can start talking about dual power. And uh, you know, we like to get to the practical to the to the to the to the practicality of everything. So, you know, most people would trace the, the, the term dual power back to Vladimir Lenin, who was like the legendary leader of the Bolshevik party that spearheaded the, you know, Russian revolution of 1917. However, the term originates decades uh, before to Pierre Joseph Proudhon, who was the founder of the anarcho mutualist uh, tradition, uh, specifically in his text on economy in 1851. So 
the way that dual power can theoretically be understood is as two political and social powers, one being the power of the ruling capitalist class and the other being the power of the working class coexisting and at the same time battling and conflicting with each other during during a period of transition away from the capitalist system. So for us, the development of dual power would entail the creation of alternative institutions and infrastructure, uh, you know, by and for poor working class, poor working class and oppressed classes uh, that will possess dem- directly democratic systems of governance. And this would allow the working class to have communal and collective control over the land, their own labor, and all that's produced within it. So, um, on a and and again, try to get more. I like I like to try to we just like to try to get more concrete and, and practical with things. So on a concrete cr- concrete level, excuse me, um, this could look like or would like look like at least for us uh, the creation of what's known as solidarity economies and decentralized confederated eco communities and villages. So um, a solidarity economy is just essentially a new, a new, a sort of new, healthy, holistic economy that is centered on new values, right? We're letting go of values that center, of course, capital accumulation, profit maximization, um, growth, uh, which to me is particular, particularly insidious. And I know that you guys have talked about deep growth a little bit, um, here on the podcast. Um, yeah, that, that no longer centers the, these, these sorts of, 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 uh, values, but we would, um, center new values of, of, again, of community solidarity, um, you know, ecological stewardship, thing, things like that. So, um, again, going back to the practical and the concrete, a solidarity economy uh, will be made up of cooperative institutions that will be involved in the the broad um, that will be involved in the broad economic process, which is the process of creation, uh, production, exchange consumption and surplus allocation and all of these phases of the economic process would holistically flow into one another right creating a self-sustaining system so for example let's take like three phases for example so in the production phase of the economic process it would have uh, I know you guys have talked about worker co-ops, specifically, you know, WSDEs, worker self-directed enterprises. You guys have had on uh, Richard Wolf. That's his whole bag, worker self-directed enterprises. Um, you could have producer co-ops, democratic ESOPs, uh, democratic nonprofits, um, fucking, you know, self-provisioning, such, you know, fishing or gardening, gardening or familial provisioning, right? And and self-provisioning will be possible because, um, you know, a, a, the hope would be is that we could open up the commons, right, for folks to use, right? Um, letting go of the bullshit uh, mythology of the, um, the, the, the tragedy of the commons, you know, this nonsensical, non-scientific bullshit. Um, and opening up the comments so that people can, <laughs> you know, uh, provision for themselves. Breach. Um, yeah, I fucking hate it. It's so dumb. <laughs> it's so dumb. Yeah, I think that uh, just just to, just to pick up on that real quick for anybody who hasn't isn't familiar with this idea of the tragedy of the commons. It's this extremely aristocratically patronizing idea that if you give people access, the commons, the lay people access to the land as it exists, they're gonna so they're gonna foul it up and soil it and overfish and destroy it and it's just a completely fallacious and ahistorical account that is a total projection of what capitalists have done that when they privatize it because the argument is if you privatize it oh then the people who own it have every incentive to preserve it and keep it you know pristine and you know the sparkling waters and the fish are so happy and the chipmunks you know it's bullshit when you give people an incentive to privatize and take over a piece of land 
They, there's no incentive at all in the structural mechanisms of money and growth for them to leave it as wild wilderness. You know, a dead tree is worth more than a live tree. You know, so basically, this this whole idea that is one of the fu- founding sort of little myths and stories, the little fairy tales that keeps you know uh, kids uh, makes kids good capitalists. Like the boogeyman is going to come get you. Oh, don't don't let the people have access to the land, or they're going to spoil it. They're going to blow it up and turn it into a fishery or a, a, a factory farm, or they're going to log it so that they can you know grow fucking soya to feed to uh, cattle to uh, make cheeseburgers, or they'll just you know make it a dump their dump dump their pollution there. Whatever it is, you know these are the things that the cat that the capitalist system directly incentivizes in terms of land use. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I absolutely agree. And I would just reference, I believe St. Andrewism on his uh, channel has a video on the commons, tragedy of the commons, I believe, but a fantastic piece that everyone should read. It's on Eon. It's called the miracle of, of the um, commons is written by a, um, I believe she's like a, um, I, I think she's like a conservationist. Her name is Michelle N- Nijulis. Um, that is a fantastic piece that deals specifically with the tragedy of the commons gets behind who the originator of the idea is and just thoroughly scientifically <laughs> debunks the, the, the whole thing. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's a really great, um, piece, but yeah. Um, but I was just giving those examples about what specific concrete, you know, institutions will be a part of particular economic phases, so, for example, in the exchange phase, there would be things like, you know, we would want to transcend this, at least for myself, speaking for myself as a as a um, a, a communist, um, a post scarcity communist specifically, um, you know, exchange would be made up of like solidarity markets, community currencies, gifting, barter clubs, fair trades, stuff like that. Now the the whole currencies thing this is moneyless society obviously we will want to trans transcend shit like that you know we don't we don't want to stick with the labor the labor notes if you know what i mean for for too long (laughs) you know we we want to we want to go go above that and ultimately uh we want to transcend we we really want to transcend economy at least in my opinion we want to transcend and abolish economy and go back again to commons ecology and economy come from the same Greek root word, and that's management of a household. And you know, economy as it stands is to empty your refrigerator as quickly as you can, just so that you can go buy more food, as Peter Joseph said eloquently. Uh, whereas ecology is is the regenerative management of that household to make sure that not only is there food in the fridge and food growing in the gardens, and the trash can is not piling up, you know, and your cupboards are are, are bare which is where we, the situation we have now, but that all the people in that household are taken care of and are healthy. And there's not an unequal power dynamic that makes the entire household, you know, structurally unsound. And that's the basic idea of, of social ecology is that it's not only maintaining land, it's not only maintaining our amount of pollution in the atmosphere, it's making sure that our social system is sustainable, that it's not creating the conditions of accumulation, and that's it's not creating positions of a hierarchical advantage where one person just through ownership of say a garden or whatever it is or some pieces of paper a stamped federal reserve note or some even more slippery uh digital money in their their meta mask or whatever it is you know that people can control and make decisions to their advantage you know we want to eliminate that and and get toward more of a less of an exchange i give you this you give me that now we're done to more of a circulation to to keep things flowing through this body that we are all a part of that we are all ultimately you know to to give to take from one and give to another doesn't make sense if you're all see each other as a part of a holistic organism i agree amen, amen. yeah amen. amen to that yeah um uh ron, ron i i can't i don't think i can hear you there yeah, I was going to say, Demetrius, I uh, talked about it earlier, too, uh, um, just how, we, and Peter Joseph uh, also eloquently describes how we have a value system disorder in this country, and <clears throat> not just in the country, this is a, a global phenomenon that we're dealing with, um, all based on this these premises of, of capitalism, and yeah, like a, a, spo- a post-scarcity mindset is the only type of mindset that will... Um, like left us out of those shackles and these like 
perpetually damning mindsets where we're like not only damning ourselves but we're damning the planet um sometimes irreversibly um yeah we just we just have to you know advance past these things like Demetrius said and it's, it's it's due time you know i feel like we're at a, a critical juncture and the evolution of humanity probably one of the more um transformational periods that we've ever endured so yeah it's it's high time we get our shit together to say the least for sure for sure and sorry demetrius i didn't mean to interrupt you there um i there's so much that I, you're just yeah. resounding like you're hitting the fucking gong of, of, of our <laughs> ethos you know we're, we're... <laughs> no exactly <laughs> yeah and i'm no, just no. i'm just echoing right back to you these things but i also love it because you're you're filling in so many of these details you're really taking us to school here and i think that our, our listeners are really going to love the especially the concrete you know, advice that we're not talking about airy fairy principles of dialectic reason or materialism or or even talking about sustainable ideals. We're talking about okay, how the fuck do we do it? That's the question. That's the question. That's the, the how do we get there? Because we know where to go. You know, there are many beautiful worlds that await us. You know, far down the road when the smoke has cleared. But the question, the really big question, is how do we get there? Absolutely. And another thing I would add to that is. You know, one of the major things we talk about is, you know, uh, uh, gaining land, right? You need to open up physical space in order to begin building the next system. Um, and, you know, there's a wonderful quote by Malcolm X where he talks about how um, the power, essentially he says, to paraphrase him, the power is in the land, right? Um, we need to be able to, to, to get a hold of land, open up physical, tangible space to begin building these things. And so um, with the acquisition of land that can then be, you know, commodified, I'm sorry, decommodified, excuse me, to the furthest extent possible, you know, under the current, you know, legal structures that we exist today, um, you know, that that's what would that's what we need to happen is we need to open up land decommodify it and then from there we can begin building and you know it's it's also important that we that we live collectively in a way that's uh once we open up the space live collectively in a way that's in balance with in balance with non-human with the non-human natural world and i use that non-human natural world sort of distinction because when we're talking about humanity we're talking about human nature right because human beings are a form of nature right and there's of you know with human society and civilization there and and what we would call nature right which is non-human nature there's a, there's a dialectical not to get too abstract but there's a dialectical like flow and in, in interchange so um but yeah that's a bit of a of a sort of basic rundown of like our basic sort of political program and strategy um also a thing that we are um, doing with um, BSA that I know Zach we talked uh, Zachary we talked about before was uh, in tech with tech development right getting into technology and I really do believe that in regards to progressive or leftist or or liberationist movements one of the things that we're just sorely lacking behind with is tech development right um, and where this is for us in BSA, this is the development of the dual power app, which would be, or excuse me, dual power map, which would allow people to see dual power projects in their local area. And also the stack app, which is, you can think of stack app, the stack app as uh, basically Zoom or whatever sort of meeting or conference sort of program you would use, but it is directly Democrat. It, it again, centers the values of direct democracy and, and communal, uh, and community. And, uh, you know, there is a trans there's transparency is privacy protecting. Um, also in the stack itself, when people put themselves in, st in stack itself, it has these really cool features of, you know, um, looking at what people's associations are, um, 
putting in, you know, what someone's identity is. And I think the identity piece fact being factored into that tech, into that um, program is really important because uh, we, you know, it is important to think about um, in a sort of democratic process, um, you know, speaking parity, right. Um, men do have a tendency to <laughs> talk over and speak longer than women. And so in, in efforts of, 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 you know, um, true solidarity and camaraderie we want to respect respect that you know um you know having women and non-males and queer folks speak first you know and and such so um yeah we're we're definitely getting into the space of tech and um something that is uh, been uh just hot news uh all over the place as of late is the utter collapse of twitter okay um twitter is a perfect example as to why we need to get in uh, into tech development and why we need uh, again a online in online infrastructure in tech that centers again direct democracy that is decentralized that um centers cooperation collaboration and um true creativity and and you know creating an online infrastructure in which everyone uh people who are super into tech people who are not super into tech anyone who's using these platforms can have a say in the way that these platforms are functioning in their design um what are the what are the sort of um social values and social organization that 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 are that are important in regards to shaping the very design of the technology itself. So obviously, as we were talking about before, we uh, capitalist social, social relations and social values uh, structure the development of tech right now. So, uh, I mean, it's all about profit, profit, excuse me, profit uh, max, maximization. Right. And so we've seen, um, you know, Elon Musk do a hostile moronic takeover of Twitter, a platform that's been around for almost a decade and literally run the shit into the ground within the span of, I wouldn't even say it's a month. Um, and I think that that's really important to understand as well. Um, that's that's important to look at as well, because that's why the sort of anarchist critique of centralization is so important. When you centralize uh, a, a system or centralize anything um, that makes it so weak because in one fell swoop, it can be destroyed. Whereas, you know, decentralization creates, a, a you know, um, creates more resilience, um, confederated and, and, and integrated decentralization uh but but creates more resilience so um yeah the the disaster that is twitter is a perfect example as to why we need the creation of as as buckchin will call it a uh, liberatory technology um so yeah th those are my thoughts on that i don't know if you if you guys have any anything that you wanted to add to that as well i definitely do i mean the uh the twitter fiasco i is it's not trivial you know, it's really not trivial. I was, t I texted this to, uh, I was going back and forth with my boy, Anarch, Daniel, Daniel Berrien, great friend, great comrade. And, Brilliant uh, we guy. Just Love him. About yeah. it. And we were kind of like almost gloating that like, this just proves everything that we've been saying for so long about the fragility of a hierarchical structure where not only is Elon a dumbass, which thank God he's come out and shown everybody, you know, his true colors, but He's show, showing the failure of the structure because this dumbass, through the pure consolidation of, of imaginary wealth, has come, been able to come in and take over quite hostily, very aggressively, like as a as an almost like he's trolling to take over this this ent this institution, you know, and just re just wreak havoc like a fucking like a pirate he just posted tweeted today the 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 pirate flag emoji you know and it really just shows us the the fragility of the hierarchical structure that the workers that make twitter what it is we're not able to stop that we're not able to save their own jobs they and it's it's odd to me that they didn't well i mean they didn't have the structure they didn't have an organizational framework to quickly organize and put their feet down and say no you can't just kick us all out no you can't just fire us all you know but it it just really I, I I sent this to Anarch that um Elon has single handedly 
it, this is the most super villainous shit I've ever seen in my life. It is the biggest example of the 80s ski movie villain coming in and buying the rec center and maybe in human history that he's bought our playground where we go and hang out and talk shit about rich people. The only place that you can go and talk shit about rich people to their face. It's the only one. Waiters can't talk shit about rich people. They have to piss in their food when they're not looking. Whatever. But yeah, he has bought the rec center and this man single-handedly has sent a rift through collective conscious, had just increasing the entropy and the chaos and the shittiness, the general shittiness of discourse across the human plane, across consciousness. He has put his thumb in the coffee cup of consciousness. And it, it's just, it's really a grotesque thing that it, it, there's so much to unpack there. And I think we should do a whole episode about it. But yeah, I mean, that idea of liberatory technology is at the heart of what we are all about here, you know, is that we are dealing with structures, not just people, not just individuals, that, you know, the good king can, maybe there are good people out there that can miraculously work their way into a, 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 the top of the power structure. But, you know, as Macbeth is a classic, very fucking old story shows us, the dickhead is going to kill that king and then he has power and there's nothing anyone can do about it. And so we need to create new structures. But yeah, as the structures themselves are, are what we're dealing with, structure and the structure of the technology and the infrastructure and the shape of our cities and roads and vehicles and things like that, they have an effect on our consciousness. And there are p very powerful ways to shift consciousness. Twitter is a great example of that. It has shifted the consciousness of humanity by giving us this, this open forum, this ability to aggregate feedback, human feedback. And I talk a lot about you know, the power that that technology and that ability for all human beings to feed back into that process of decision making, you know, with the assistance of algorithms could truly transform decision making as we know it. And I would really recommend anybody watch our episode. Um, uh, it's called uh, D Direct Digital Democracy, I think, with Magnova. Can we create an app to replace the government? Um, and that's really what we're trying to create here. And I, I think that I am really excited to talk more about the dual power app. I would love to talk with the developers and do a whole episode just about it. Because from the first time I heard those words, I was just kind of like, you know, just a chomping at the bit because it just makes so much sense. I mean, it's clearly, it's obvious what needs to be done. We need to create, as you said, confederations of eco villages and communities and cooperatives and structures in this solidarity economy that is networked together that is not siloed that it's not we're not just going to go create our own little commune and then we're we're gone poof and to get back to old vi lenin and the russian revolution a lot of people you know use that as an example for like why violent revolution works or whatever or why the vanguard works but the reason that that revolution was successful which you can debate all day uh, was because of the Soviets, which were workers' councils. They were organi workers organized into collective structures across the country, you know, in a network that were communicating with each other that built the foundation for this, sh this clash with the system. They built power. And it's just like, until we build power, it doesn't, all the theory doesn't mean shit. Like, there are, are very important conversations about. What would we do if we had power? What kind of society would we build? You know, how would we grow food? How would we make decisions? And I think technology offers you know good answers for a lot of those questions. But until we build that power, until we organize ourselves, and currently we we're not succeeding to organize ourselves with these corporate platforms that are designed based on casinos. You know, <laughs> sorry, Ron, I think you had something to say there. Oh yeah, you guys are both just making a hell of a lot of sense right now. Um, but just to piggyback off what like both of you are saying, like it goes back to these like centralized, um, like concentrated systems where just simply because like these people are in what we perceive as positions of power, now you can monopolize industries and displace competitors and. Um, yeah, like it's, it's it's a very uh, dangerous thing and it's a, a slippery slope and um, it kind of feeds into this tendency that like I've noticed billionaires kind of have to involve themselves in things that they're not necessarily qualified for simply because it's like they can, like I'm saying, like um, because they have that influence 
over culture and society like um whatever whatever venture they want to dabble in you know it's it's accessible to them and that's yeah that's the pinnacle of like inequality there's no one else in society that's afforded those type of um, opportunities just at a whim you got to <clears throat> pull yourself up by the bootstraps to do that but these billionaires they can just like at the snap of a finger not to i mean get too conspiratorial but um you have guys like uh bill gates and the Soroses who are involved in um like these philanthrop philanthropic uh like endeavors that seem to never really translate into anything productive for society as a whole it's more so um an agenda that that they seem to want to further rather than you know appealing to us so we have we have to appeal to ourselves like y'all are saying you know the power has to come from from us um, we can't relinquish that power to someone else or expect someone else to come and save us billionaires are so mind fucking blowingly rich they have so much money that it is literally unimaginable like if you made five hundred thousand dollars a day from the day christopher columbus uh set foot on the good old sweet soil of the Americas and started genociding people, you would still not have even close to the amount of money that Jeff Bezos has. There is no way a human being can, you know, earn that money. And the only thing left for them to buy, because there's not that they, they've just bought it all. The world is owned, are like almost abstract ideas, like transportation. Elon Musk is trying to be, he's trying to have a monopoly on transportation, you know, with the hyperloop and with, you know, self-driving cars and and you know, with all of these things, Zuckerberg is, is owning, trying to own communications. You know, you have people like uh, Rupert Murdoch that own communications or, or Ted Turner. You have, they're trying to own infrastructure, not just like a company, but infrastructure itself. Like Jeff Bezos owns commerce and he has a monopoly on commerce, all things, the sale of all things. And that is a truly grotesque possibility uh, sorry it, it, the, the possibility that money allows that capital as the as bickler and nitson who are, are a couple of brilliant thinkers have stated capital is power it's not just money elon musk is not out there trying to make money because it doesn't money doesn't exist to them you know they have so much money their money exponentially makes itself and expands endlessly to the point where they own, they want power and buying twitter is buying power and for us to have power to create our own applications that allow us to freely organize and share resources, that is an incredible amount of power that we will not win this battle with without. Absolutely. And to kind of, to also speak to your point about the sort of history of violent revolutions, I think I would say most of those revolutions as we know it today, at least the ones that involved, you know, replacing one government with another and then just calling itself a uh, communist, <laughs> which, you know, if anyone knows the, 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 the uh, traditional definition of communism, you know, the first thing is stateless, <laughs> there, there won't be a state. But I think um, one of the primary issues is that, you know, what we're really dealing with is social relations is social relationships. And we have, and it's important to understand that the way in which we design structures, institutions, and systems is based upon social, the, our, our social values and social relationships, right? So if people still have a con have a dominator, hierarchical, exploiter, patriarchal, ethnocentric, um consciousness then the systems that we begin to the systems and structures we create will take on all of those traits so when you have this sort of idea of revolution which to me is one of the the weakest parts of of marxist theory is this theory of revolution because it's internally contradictory if you have a revolution that's trying to take political power take over the state and then from the top down rather than the bottom up build revolution it's it's bound to fail it's bound to fail um because and and it's 
internally contradictory, right? If you if you are someone who believes in, is a Marxist and you believe in historical materialism and that the economic and material base of a society is that which shapes the superstructure, which would be art, politics, culture, everything else. Why the fuck would you take over the superstructure to try to change the base when you know that the base is that which primarily influences the superstructure? So it's internally contradictory. And so what we are talking about with building dual power, building dual power institutions and just starting to make the next system is actually more in line with if if you care about that um, is more in line with the Marxian idea of, of historical materialism. Right. Starting with the base to to transform everything else. And what I would say is and this is going to be sound kind of controversial, but please bear bear with me. Um, Bring it on. I would say (laughs) bring on the clickbait. (laughs) I would say that in that sense of thinking about revolution through. Oh, shit. Here he goes. Through dual power. Pop off. We we have to kind of take a page out of capitalism's book now listen to what i'm saying <laughs> whoa there whoa now there we go here it comes so All so right. we've got to acquire as much capital as we can we got to get our hands right. on capital that's, that's the grip win. that's we the grip look, that's the grip win. right we got the grip no but if you look at the way in which <laughs> capitalism arose arose historically and subsumed feudalism it wasn't simply because the bourgeoisie were waging a violent overthrow of the um the um aristocracy or the nobility or whatever what you saw was that the economic process reached a certain stage of evolution there were certain phenomena and events that took place at that time materially economically that allowed capitalism to gain power. Now, don't get me wrong, there were violent skirmishes and conflicts, but that was on that that was to, that was after, that was towards the tail tail end. What what it really was was particular phenomena such as the uh scientific revolution, uh the beginning of land enclosures, uh, the development of new technologies and new forms of trade, the fact that um, the uh, Britain and, and England at that time opened itself up uh, to international trade, right? Something that wasn't done before. So these particular, um, this particular sort of evolution in the mode of production allowed capitalism, uh, the capitalist system and the bourgeoisie to, to, to gain more material power. They were gaining the land. They were gaining, accumulating capital. They were able to produce things quicker and in different ways and produce different things. Right. It it was the, it was the, it started with the economic and the material base. It wasn't just violent overthrow. Okay. For us in our context, and I think about things in terms of post-scarcity communism, what are the what what are the technological and scientific advancements that we have today in the 21st in the 21st century that that lets us know that for sure we can transcend capitalism right and all of us can sit on this call and and talk about all sorts of technologies and scientific breakthroughs that let us know for sure that we can transcend this bullshit we know that we that that we can use science, the scientific knowledge and the technological advancements that we have today to feed and clothe everyone on the planet. If we wanted to end the fucking global water crisis today, we could. We have the scientific organization to do that. So every everything is in place. I think that what's happening right now is that. Because we're in, we, we're, you know, we're, we're post, we're a post eighties generation. You know, the eighties is when the, the new world order, if you want to call it neoliberalism arose, right? This, this sort of notion that all of the world and all of society and all of culture should be, um, ran with the, with, with, um, what, uh, Mark Fisher calls a, um, a business ontology, 
right? Everything should function like a market. Everything should function like a corporation. As a matter of fact, if there are political and social ills, we don't try to, you know, do politics to fix anything, right? Uh, what we do is we send it to the market, let the market sort it out, fix it. You know, this, this brutal, monstrous mutant form of capital will create, will create a factory that makes bootstraps and will let the workers work in the factory. Yes. And if they work hard and fast enough, they can spend a, a, a portion of their salary that doesn't go toward, or well, they're not, we're not getting a salary, but you know, they're the wage that they get. Wage, their wage yes. <laughs> they get a portion of their meager wage that doesn't go toward uh, rent in its, all of its various forms and debt, of course, furnishing their credit card bills. Uh, they can spend that on bootstraps and then they can work to pull themselves up. Right, right. Which that's, is fucking that's, crazy, that's, but that's neoliberalism in a nutshell. That, that's what we live in. That's that's what we live in. The fact that, for example, you know, um, I'm a resident of Texas. The fact that the lieutenant governor of Texas, when COVID first started, and people were seriously like, yo, we need to shut the economy down. We don't need to get workers sick. We don't need to transfer this stuff around. We know that elderly people are more vulnerable. And the fact that the lieutenant, lieutenant governor of, of Texas, Dan Patrick, said that, you know, hey, I, I think that, you know, people's grandparents will be willing to sacrifice themselves for, you know, freedom for the economy. I mean, that sort but of wouldn't thinking, be willing, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, that sort of a blatant authoritarian fascist sort of thinking that human life should be, you know, subservient to economic ends is, is insane. Sacrifice your grandparents to capitalism. I mean, of all the things that the, the pandemic gave us, that soundbite is one of the greatest ever, you know? Ever. Uh, as a senior citizen, uh, are you willing to take a chance on your survival in exchange for keeping the America that all America loves for your children and grandchildren? And if that's the exchange, I'm all in. We're, we're just like mask off, this is who we are, throw your fucking grandfather in the volcano and yes. pray to the market. And maybe it will not kill you in the fucking coming ice storm. Yes. Maybe. Sacrifice, sacrifice your loved if ones. If you're Christian and on. don't do gay stuff either. And right. right. <laughs> yes. <Yeah, sac> <laughs> sacrifice your family, your, your loved ones to mammon, right? We, we got to keep it going. We got to keep the production going. We got to continue to extract and exploit as much as possible. Right. Um, and so, and it's funny, as much as capitalist societies shit talk, you know, the so-called communist societies, they're basically doing the same shit. Your human life is, is, is meant to serve profit, capital, production. That, that's, that's it. We're totally subservient to economic, economic ends. So the, the so-called uh, socialist or communist societies of today, as I see it, basically just have a different philosophy of how they treat their stuff. You know, it's like the American, to compare them to like a plantation, the American plantation is like the people are like a, an old beater truck that they're like hitting potholes in on purpose. <laughs> they're like trying to get it to break down as quickly as possible so they can get a, go get a new one. Whereas like the Chinese Communist Party's perspective on human life is like, no, no, we want to take better care of our farm equipment. We don't want to beat it. We don't want to destroy our, our tools because these are ultimately what, in, what we're using to, you know, destroy the earth to enrich ourselves in this fashion. And I think it, it's, it's very unpleasant and difficult and it, you know the the di that dialectic thinking that cyclical sort of uh look the, the the feedback loop i think is the best way of understanding a dialectic it's a better it's a better more scientific way of looking at things as a cyclical process but you know the the western hegemony is is dominating world markets in this way and forcing them to be competitive and ruthless in this manner and you know the other states in the world have to be brutal and keep up. I was debating with somebody about markets the other day, and it's like we have this free will view that you know all the all the drivers in traffic are making free choices about how they fast they go, but that's not really true because if somebody behind you speeds up, you have to speed up too. If somebody ahead of you speeds up, the person behind you is going to honk at you to speed up. So ultimately, we're all trapped in this race to the bottom, and ultimately, that condition of I have to get to work or I'm going to fucking if i miss my job i'm gonna starve that pushes those people to speed in the first place 
So every everybody, every player on the game, every player on this game of risk that we're playing in, which is a game of risk, you know, it's a controlled risk that we're risking the destruction of the earth so that we can advance ourselves. I mean, these old theories that we're going to advance ourselves to this level of material development, and then of course we'll bring about communism. I mean, it's 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 false, and it's 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 very sad to behold and to see people not question it and to say that oh, you know, China is communist and, you know, we have no right as Westerners to critique them and it's racist. And I just think that's a very foolish position because it's not, it's not looking at material conditions, which right now are fucking parts per million of carbon in our atmosphere or the de destruction of our forests or the dredging of, you know, uh, coral reefs and, and, you know, river basins and the destruction of the soil. What are you laughing about, Ron? <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing at my cat. <laughs> He's out here exploring the Starbucks parking lot. <laughs> That's funny that you're uh, recording in this in this wasteland, this corporate. Yeah, right, right, the irony. <laughs> you're on the you're on the corporate Wi-Fi recording here. <laughs> that's the that's yeah, the so dialectic. Just, just quit it. That's the dialectic. You're talking about liberation at Starbucks, huh? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, but to I'm but to your point. <laughs> No, no. But but to your point, Zachary, yeah, I absolutely agree. Like, you know, one thing that they tell you when you start driving is that, you know, um, when you're on the freeway, you have to remain in the flow of traffic. You got to you got to speed up. You got to do the speed limit. Right. That's how it works. Same shit with the, with this fucking capitalist system we, we have to stay in the flow of traffic unfortunately that flow of traffic is uh careening us towards ecological uh collapse and infrastructural decay <laughs> right? off a cliff. <laughs> we we gotta keep we gotta keep growth it, it's about growth mm -hmm. we have to keep growing like a fucking cancer that's assumed that will consume everything we have to grow um and yeah and and yeah th those are my those are just my some of my thoughts when it comes to um the the economic aspect but you know uh one thing that i would i would love to to to, to discuss and love uh, and ron i would love to get your uh, opinion on this too is obviously the thing that sticks out in our uh, organization's name is black <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I do think it would be uh, I would be remiss to not talk about how um, race white supremacy and um, identity um, plays into what we're talking about because uh, with BSA our whole thing is not only talking about class we, we also talk about race and so um, you know, in us talking about the the dumpster fire <laughs> that is uh, the, the the capitalist system, that is intimately tied into um, the 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 legacy of the transatlantic slave trade and uh, settler colonialism, right? Um, and I think this is where um, this might be a little controversial again, but I think this is where. Oh Looking shit! At, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Crank it up, them views. You, you Get know, ready with those comments, <laughs> y'all. Well, we'll Get ready people, algorithm. Right. Well, well, we you know we have these terms that exist today that you know even I have unfortunately partaken in. But we have these terms, you know, PLC, people of color, or BIPOC, <gasps> to try to you know. Here we go. I know to try to you know put all these here comes the take. <laughs> no, to, to put all these I identities uh, and, and people groups together that are non-white, which is which, um, you know, there is absolutely merit in that. But I do think it's important to look at the unique historical situation of indigenous and black people, particularly in the new world. Right. We're talking about when we're talking about the political, social, economic systems that we're talking about. We are talking about a system that that could only have been created that was created through the clearing out of space, th which meant the genocide of indigenous people and the theft and exploitation of enslaved African people, the, the ancestors. Um, our entire uh, the modern world as we have it today was constructed from that. It was constructed from the transatlantic slave trade and settler colonialism um that that regime of brutality went on for centuries and created the the economic and material 
base for the modern world, right? This was during a time of of capitalism's infancy, infancy, you know, what Marx would call primitive accumulation and what Sven Becker um, in his book, Empire of Cotton calls war capitalism, right? The, 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 the violent acquisition of land, the, of, of land, you know, free land, free space, the violent acquisition of workers, free labor in order to develop this, this new world that we have today and everything that exists, especially in the so-called Western world is based off of this. And so, um, and also what played into that development was the develop played into that was the development of states of nation states as well. So black people sit at a, un- at a very unique historical, uh, we we're in a very unique historical position and it is my opinion that um, black people are the, the the perfect subjects to re- to rebel against all this shit, <laughs> to to rebel against the state, to to want to destroy capitalism, right? We are the perfect subjects for that because from the blood, sweat, and tears of the ancestors was uh, forcibly built this world that we have today, and all of its you know, creature comforts and, and shit like that. Um, and I, and, and so that's why I would say that black people, we do have a vested interest in, in, in tearing all of this shit down. And that's why it's so important that we do hold, um, revolutionary and emancipatory and liberatory, um, uh, uh, values. And I can get more into that if, if, if you want, uh, particularly around, you know, race and identity and stuff like that. Um, but Ron, I, I would love to hear your 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 uh, take on on that. I mean, you hit the nail on the head, uh, <clears throat> starting with you know the the massacring and displacing and genociding of indigenous populations, which um, likely looking at historical records included people like us. You know, it wasn't just um, the the typical. Um, the typical image um, of a native um, that we all like uh, commonly share, you know, we were, we were involved in that too, actively trading amongst these populations. So like you're saying, it's an, it's an ancestral thing. Um, Everything in our ancestry opposes and um, rebels against these like oppressive systems. Um, I've noticed that one problem in our community specifically is that, and it's not, not specifically our community, but, um, I feel like it's something that we should be more conscious of given this history is that, you know, capitalism is, you know, it's, it's the root at the end of the day. If you're going to, if you're going to point fingers, if you're going to like diagnose issues, you can't leave capitalism, capitalism out of the conversation. And I feel like that's something it's kind of an elephant in the room when it comes to our communities. Like there's a very toxic mindset um, surrounding money. Like it's um, ever fleeting and, you know, it's, you can never get enough of it. You that that has to be your main focus. Um, when it's, it's should be the exact opposite. I'm sitting here like, why the why the hell um, are we allowing the the people who displaced these communities to now come and redefine um, life for us? It, it's a very paradoxical thing. Um, so yeah, it, it's gonna take like um, awareness on our part to to have the courage to say, cause it, cause it takes courage. Um, it's not a popular stance to take to say, Hey, maybe these aren't the systems that we should be diverting our energy towards. Maybe we should look into something that's, you know, beneficial for us all rather than a few rich goon mogul, like fucking capitalist <laughs> overlords. Um, yeah, it's gonna, yeah. It, and there, and that's another thing I feel like, um, our community is lacking is a sense of community. We, we've allowed this ever pervading like um, dogma and psychopathy of capitalism to convince us as well that, you know, it's, it's a, it's a a dog eat dog world. And we're all out here for ourselves. Like, no, we like our, our people should, you know, um, have the backs of our people more than anyone on this planet. 
but yeah, you see us here, um, you know, pretty much having an identity crisis, not knowing where we fit into society. And that that's a, a purposeful thing. It was a systematic um, in its inception. Um, even yeah, going back to the the colonizing of of this land, like you have the Pope um, signing uh, like papal bulls like Intercaterra and Dom de Versus, literally outlining the people that they're gonna come over here and subjugate um, if they're uh, not willing to submit to them or to their religion. And yeah, it's it's just these psychotic things that 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 you see, and you're just like yeah, we there there's no room here for for us and our development you know like we have to we have to do better we have to transcend this stuff but yeah i could go on and on about that yeah I, uh, ron i absolutely agree with you and that is something that you do see amongst black people within our within our community is like because you know we we have internalized american values right which means internalizing capitalist values so there is a sort of money motivated money oriented attitude that you will see amongst our people and you know that is accelerated even more due to the fact that we have spent centuries of our time in 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 the so-called western world it's so deeply impoverished, you know, coming out of chattel slavery. And as, as Dr. King said, um, you know, in an interview that he had, you know, the, the, the government or the state didn't give us a real economic base, right? We were promised 40 acres and a mule didn't get shit. <laughs> right. We just got fucking chain gangs and, and, and black codes and all yeah. the and Jim Crow, and, you know, and guns and drugs. <laughs> and, and that's, that's what they gave us, you know, and they, and they run the same, they run the same program on indigenous people. You, you can see it. When indigenous communities are 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 um, destabilized, they get sent to ghettos, and they, you know, this is why the indigenous communities struggle with things such as you know alcoholism and just um, health issues and stuff like that. It's so sad to see, but it's the same program of of of, of colonialism and domination um, in service to you know extraction and exploitation, and yeah, it 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 is all un- it, in unfortunate, and that's why I think. You know, so many, so many black people, we are in the sort of space of liberal politics, right? You know, almost always faithful Democratic Party voters and such. And we have internalized these these so called these American so called American values and stuff like that. But I think that's was that's what's important about individuals such as ourselves and organizations such as ours is that we can um, let people know like, Hey, you know, there's a pot, there is this powerful and beautiful thing called the black radical tradition that was thinking about a, a new humanity, a new life, a new way of being with one another outside of the state and capital outside of these global um, interlocked and intersecting systems of domination and exploitation. Um, and yeah, I, I just see black socialists in America as being, um, a part of, a part of that, the, the movement to spread a new sort of consciousness, um, uh, primarily amongst, amongst black people. And, um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Zachary, I know you want to, to say something. No, I was just going to say that I was talking about this today with a friend um, that runs an account on Instagram called Black Leftist, and his mission is to find other Black leftists and ask that central question. That's what we were talking about. We were talking about creating a show that's just called "Why Aren't There More Black Leftists?" And you know, you can picture the thumbnail. It's got MLK and and uh, and Malcolm X and and um, Huey Newton, and they just all have crosshairs over their heads. Reason one: they get fucking murdered. You know, anytime you know Black people, Indigenous people stand up and speak out you know and it doesn't require like some esoteric theory for for black people to experience it and that what's make that's what makes the black experience so powerful and so beautiful and so dangerous to capitalism is because hello they were like this whole system is built on literal fucking slavery not not wage slavery that's slavery with plausible deniability although it absolutely just crushes my heart every time i have to go into a store like i live in atlanta and I, uh, 
am a poor person, so I shop at the poor person store. And at all the poor people's stores, and most of the rich people's stores, the people working in the cash register are black. And it's just like, why have we accepted this intolerable position of servitude? Why, why is it that white people are not more abolitionists? You know, why, why is it a minority position to say, I am against the pointless enslavement and continued servitude of this group of people that has had everything taken from them? And that it just, it continually inspires me to see the life that black people carry in them, the fire that, that just cannot be extinguished, the art and the music and the culture and the ability to fucking just carry on through it, you know? That white people are fucking going out and shooting up schools because they can't get dates, you know? What, like, I've never seen a, a shooting from a black person. Like, I've never seen a, ma a, a black person commit a mass shooting, you know? I've never seen that. And it, it, it's just beca it's because- We, like, we have uh, one. I sure. think it's one. Uh, I think it's like the, the DC sniper. The just, just, I think there was just the one guy, like the DC sniper, which was very, very odd. That, that is very odd, yeah. <laughs> We're too, we're like too scared that, of what our, our moms will do when they find out. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's, there's a deep point even in that, you know, that, that there is still a connection to family and to community. And I think this is true with, you know, all marginalized communities, all poor communities, that the more money in society, the less trust. You know, the, the less money in society, the more people have to depend on and trust each other. And the more um, connected to those bonds of humanity and, and sociality and togetherness and you know, communalism, the more connected we are. And I think that is such a powerful thing that is really lacking in a lot of like these, whatever you want to call them, left spaces. I was talking about this today. I don't really identify as a leftist or as any of these schools of thought because it's, it's their belief systems imposed on humanity that we're, we're practicing this way of life. Black people in, all over the, the planet Indigenous people all over the planet were practicing these egalitarian, communalistic ways of life long before some guy named Karl Marx came out and stamped, you know, a label on it. And so, yeah, that I think it's, but we need to reconnect to that. And I think that, you know, using technology like the Dual Power app, you know, creating organizations like this, getting the, just getting the conversation out there is, is reconnecting us to that. And I, I just see, I just feel so much solidarity and you know, love and appreciation for y'all's organization, for your mission, and for, you know, all the marginalized people out there that have been sold this really cheap, sad, disgusting, internalized capitalist narrative that their way out is to play the game and make more money. Yeah, you can't out-capitalize capitalism. And um, a lot of us are trying to see you know, like financial freedom or entrepreneurship as um, some sort of like liber liberatory uh, pathway from these constraints. And me personally, like, I'm just, I'm just not seeing it. Uh, yeah, what's that? <laughs> I was just going to say that um, something I wanted to talk about in this episode was that um, the Black Panthers were at one point seen as the greatest threat, not just to, you know, polite society, but to the American empire. That the, that's what the, that's how they were viewed by the government, and I believe J. Edgar Hoover or someone else high up in the organization said that the Black Panthers' breakfast program was the greatest threat to American empire, and that right there is an amazing stamp of the power that coming together and creating these dual power networks and systems of directly providing for the unmet needs that the state not only doesn't meet but systematically reinforces that this is the truly most powerful thing that we can do. Not, you know, blow up a cop car as, as much as we all love marshmallows. <laughs> um, it's, it's feeding each other. It's creating food systems. It's creating housing structures. It's creating permanent culture that we can em embody and live in that can support us through this, that can that where we can work to directly to eradicate these inequalities and imbalances in us. Unfortunately, those things don't sound hip or uh, cool enough for the masses to uh, to adapt to, and I I think we yeah that's that's another goal of mine. Um, if if there's one, I would say I have is to help make like uh, what we call revolution or radicalism like 
like cool, you know, or cool again. I mean, it was cool back in the day in the Black Panthers, but if you were, that, that was the place to be. That was the that was the idea to get behind. But now we've kind of like lost our way. Now we're falling back into uh, social norms and constructs. Um, it, it's time we like think outside the box again um, and like allow that to be our, our guiding compass rather than the the like institutional um, mindsets and like ways of thinking that have been kind of laid out for us. Not any, it's not anything um, original, original that's being conceptualized, like even in entrepreneur spaces, like uh, the, um, there's just a, a lot of people, um, even when you, when you think you're like taking some sort of like original pathway, like it's it's already been there done like people have already been there done that like there, there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to the system like and you're not gonna you know free yourself from the system with the system and i think that's that's important you know and so yeah we got to make revolution cool again yeah i i i totally agree with that ron i think yeah part of the reason why artistic endeavors i mean the major reason why artistic endeavors under a capitalist system you know, um, just our garbage for the most part, why we're seeing so many remakes and sequels of this movie and that movie and why there isn't so, uh, so much originality is because in order to be creative and imaginative, it, it, it requires risk taking and listen, we don't, you know, listen, if, if, if you're a, a capitalist, you know, film or movie firm or, or whatnot, Yo, we're we're trying to get fucking money. We're trying to get paid. We're trying to get to the profits. We're trying to get to capital. We don't need to take a risk. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make another fucking uh, blockbuster, shitty superhero movie. Grab some obscure character that nobody barely even knows. Make a, a sink how many ever millions of dollars into it. Release it um, during the summer. So you know. Uh, uh, you know, high school kids and whomever can go and consume it and watch it so that we can get this return on investment. So you can get this money. It's, it's not about <laughs> using this, this art form to convey, you know, the realities of fuck of, 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 of human life. You know, what is it is to, what, what does it mean? What does it mean to be in community with someone? What does it mean to love someone? What does it mean to grieve? What does it mean to feel pain? Like those things. I mean, that's not, that's not the, 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 the shit that's going to sell was going to sell is fast five, uh, you know, the fast and the furious 20. <laughs> You know, that's, what, you know, um, I got a quick shout out to a movie that actually did fucking knock it out of the park that came out fairly recently by Boots Riley, another communist oh, yeah. who Boots, if this makes it to you, fucking come on our show, please. I would love to chop it up with him and talk about my movie that I'm working on because I need to connect with people in this industry or <laughs> yeah. into capitalists because that's like the, the driving motivation of my movie or the style anyway is make fucking revolution cool. And yes. I, I think that, you know, we really have the power to do that because it is fucking cool. Nothing else is cooler. There's nothing else more fucking punk rock. That's literally the coolest or, shit exciting. like you could possibly involve yourself in. <laughs> I mean, like, just look at the look at the fucking right. style that the Black Panthers had in the 70s. Yeah. Nobody had yeah. more grip in human history. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was going to say that <laughs> this could be a potentially long tangent, but I wanted to I wanted to rip into real quick the worst, the, the most racist movie I've ever seen. And this is going to be a controversial opinion. I'm going to get fucking... I'm going to get torn apart for this. The most racist movie I've ever seen is Black Panther. Oh, what? What did he say? What? I can see and that. I'll tell you why. I can see I can see I can see that. If you watch I can see it. If you watch that movie with an understanding of ideology and see what's really going on, first of all, he's a fucking monarch who lives in this super high-tech ecotopia and some, you know, solar punk world who has this super high technology and everyone around him is literally like throwing sticks and stones at each other and is ridiculously impoverished because of the colonial enterprises around them. And they don't share their technology. There's literally a scene where he's like, what are we, you know, we can't have refugees coming in here. And nobody says shit and the scene just ends. It's out of nowhere. It's crazy. So the, the, uh, they partner with their partner to save the world 
is, of course, the CIA. Great, you know, the notorious white CIA friend guy. of the black yes. man. Yes. <laughs> the white CIA guy. And the villain of the movie, who, his, whose name is Killmonger, sounds like a great guy. Uh, his stated direct in, in, in intention, his plan is to take this high technology from the fucking monarch and use it to liberate the oppressed of the world. And Black Panther's like, no, we've got to stop him. He must be stopped. We must preserve the world order. And they kill this motherfucker, this hero. And then what do they do? This is the most Obama bullshit I've ever seen in my entire life. He flies in his fucking spaceship, fucking flying car to Compton and they build a motherfucking rec center. Oh my God. And people came out of this movie and were like, oh, this is revolutionary. And it's just like the ability gentrify, for capitalism yeah. to subsume revolutionary uh, e e um, aesthetics and cloak them in style, which, you know, there was some amazing art and d design and, you know, some great creators made that movie. But it was written by white people, it was directed by white people, and it was ultimately a disgusting example of hiding the pill in the, in, you know, the dog food, the pill is ideology and it is rotting our brains and we need to create new stories and, you know, new heroes, uh, to show people what a real hero is, you know, so that people don't leave the theater thinking that a fucking monarch is their hero. Exactly. And it's, it's a, it's like you're saying, it's a mentality thing. It's an ideology thing. And that's, that's all purely propaganda when they do this thing where, you know the 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 so-called villain in the in the plot um it's kind of making some some fair valid points about the state of the world and you know maybe the actions that need to be taken but um they try to um portray that sort of re rhetoric as like villainous and dangerous only these these type of like crazy psychotic people have these ideas like fucking thanos is and yeah killmonger is they 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 only want they're they're power hungry and you know no, like if you if you really like break down and synthesize and analyze what a lot of these like villains are saying, they're they're pretty you know like rational uh, points that are addressing the systemic issues that like uh, result from you know these people who are trying to protect themselves in these movies as you know the 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 monarchs who um, are worthy of like wielding this sort of power you know. Exceptional individuals protecting the status quo against exactly. against dangerous radicals, which mm -hmm. is how the media treats every great American hero, <laughs> like from from Crazy Horse to Fred Hampton, like it, it, they've all been treated like that, like evil yep. dark villains, you know. Mm -hmm. I th yeah, and and also, I mean, you also have to talk about the fact that like so many of these superheroes are working with the state and working with the military and literally in the development of those sorts of films uh the 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 people who are creating the films are literally in communication with the military taking advice from the military i mean fucking i believe it was um uh captain marvel was was developed in conjunction with the navy because the character was like in the military so it's just it's just fucking terrible but i but i wanted to speak to to something that you said Zachary, when you were talking about like why why haven't people seen through the illusion that is race and 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 come together in in a in a relation of solidarity i think part of it is just like i mean you know of course we people believe in 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 race and there's so many things that um reinforce and reify <clears throat> excuse me the idea that race is real and you know it, it even when you're talking about science and and uh medicine right scientists uh play into the reification of the idea that biological race is real amongst human beings and uh, uh the medical profession you know with doctors right there's this this idea that you know particular so-called racial groups are you know more vulnerable to particular diseases and stuff like that which is, i mean it's all total total bullshit right it's it we're still working with this false idea and this false conception of race however race we do know is a social category categorization and a social construct but at the same time in in a sense it's real and it's real because of racism right the effects of this this concept of race 
are real. When we talk about the 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 the, the disparities in housing, in healthcare, in um uh the 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 environments in which people live, the disparities in terms of property ownership and land ownership, and 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 uh, wealth and generational wealth, all of those things are things that can be seen. Uh. uh revealed to us through, you know, empirical and scientific in, in, in investigation. And so <clears throat> people are just invested in that idea, particularly white people. Um, there's this concept by W.E.B. Du Bois, where he talks about what's, what's called the psychological wages of, of, of whiteness and other scholars of whiteness studies, folks like David Rodinger, um, uh, um, uh, Theodore W. Allen, Noel Ignatieve, who is particularly important, I think, in this conversation, who wrote the book um, "How the Irish Became White." You know, they talk about white, white, the white poor and working class who have been fucked over from the very inception of the system. I mean, there were even, um, I believe. Um, <clears throat> English people and British people who were literally kidnapped and taken to the so-called new world to also be uh, essentially uh, uh, um, workers as well. Right. Um, But there have been always been poor and working class white folks who have been fucked over by capitalism. But we're at this place where, you know, right wing politics have totally swept over white people and they're and they're all in you know they're eating the shit up they're eating they love trump you know they love daddy trump right they're they're, you know they're god emperor trump right and not only that they fully given into the sort of psychological wages of whiteness that fool poor and working class white people into siding with the bourgeoisie siding with the ruling the white ruling class and such right um and and it's just unfortunate because you know, in, in that place of class <clears throat> there, excuse me, in that place of class, there, there can be so, there's so much commonalities between white folks, black folks, and brown folks. And, and, and that could, and, and it could open up the doors to so much solidarity. Right. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the psychological wages of whiteness, people are, they they totally drink the drink the cool the Kool Aid or the milk right to to stick with the the whiteness thing. <laughs> there's there's one of my one of my favorite um MLK speeches. Um, he talks about how the poor white man has always been on the front lines of every war and has always been jammed into the factory, and um has been basically fucked by capitalism, and you know instead of giving him something, you know the establishment gave him Jim Crow to eat. And he ate Jim Crow, and it says basically, you know, you may be poor, but at least you're not black. You may be, you know, uh, f- totally fucking broke, fucked over, powerless, you know, but at least you're not an immigrant. You know, it's 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 othering, and it's it's, you know, if you really go into the actual creation of race as a as a distinction, because as you're saying, you know, it's not a real medical biological distinction it was a fabrication a social construction that was reified and reinforced specifically to drive a wedge between workers coming together to say hey this arrangement where one percent of us tells us all what to do and fucking reaps all the rewards isn't really good for any of us and i I actually want to make a to zoom out a little bit there as well and to go beyond class even because in in the current crisis, the stakes of what capitalism is doing in, in its subjugation of nature, which is the ultimate, the ultimate servant, the ultimate other, you know, that, you know, we are all on the verge of extinction and annihilation. And the, the creation of, an, of a level of scarcity that it could, could literally doom us all. And so there is a unification in environmental injustice that all peoples even the rich even the fucking rich even though they're hard, the hardest to communicate with we are all, we all have everything to gain and everything to lose sorry we all have everything to lose by continuing in this game and we have everything to gain by casting it off and you know seeking genuine unification that we you know the enclosures of of the of the feudal era continue today in the artificial scarcity that keeps us 
you know, driving in cars on a road, you know, where we're basically paying many tolls to a private company, to all these, you know, people that we have to pay, we have to pay the fossil fuel companies to do anything. We have to pay, you know, car companies just to be able to get any, we don't have public transit. We don't have healthcare. We don't have any of these institutions. We don't have an educated population. We don't have good movies and media. Like all of this shit is a product of the capitalist system that is limiting the quality of life for us all. And if we can shift back into that creative commons and to the true physical creation of a commons, of a networked, you know, interconnected, you know, community of communities in society that we can use technology to scale up to the point where everybody has a direct interface with all the people in their community, where we're all having, we all have a real impact in the way society is designed and made and decisions are made, where we're all participating collectively to the real work of advancing humanity, of advancing life on earth. You know, there is a positive, beautiful vision in there beyond all the doom and gloom, beyond, you know, the the guilt and the fear and the estrangement. And, you know, I I, I dream of that unification. I dream of, of an undivided humanity. And it's just so sad to me that, you know, black capitalism and representation in the false representation of representative democracy and black CEOs and female trans drone pilots are what we're being sold as the antidote to racism, to sexism, to classism. And, oh, it's not the class, it's not the system that demands a master and an uh, and a slave. That is ultimately the system that we're continuing continually operating on, a system of slavery. The slavery is the way that the world works still. And re real quick little note there to try to uh, bring it all together that I read the other day that the uh, Greeks had comparatively lesser technology than the peoples around them. But because they had a system of slavery, they had no incentive to develop better technology and more efficient means of doing things because they could throw bodies into a hole and get them done just as fine. So we don't have an incentive in this wage slave system to create efficient systems of creating food, water, you know, clothing, housing, technology. That There's no incentive. You know, because we can throw bodies into a hole and continually exploit and exploit and exploit until the end of the earth. But uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, Demetrius, we're running up on time here. Um, I would love for you to sort of close the loop and bring us on home with ideally some some solutions, some optimism, some you know manifestations of dual power. Juice us up, plug us in. Let's get powered up. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll try to plug plug us in. I mean, yeah. Um, really, it's uh, what I would say is to be hopeful and to think about hope and not optimism but hope and i make that distinction because to be hopeful is to look at possibilities to be optimistic is to look at odds and i think that we're at a point now where we have to say you know to hell with the fucking odds we know that the odds we know that things are looking rough right now again as i said before we're <laughs> leaning towards destruction of the entire planet right destabilization of the entire planet but i think we have to look at hope what is possible based upon what we can start doing right here right now today the oppressed the marginalized the working class the poor classes of this world what can we start doing today to build the new system how can we start, how can we begin to invest in our, for lack of a better term, not to use capitalist terms to talk about the future, but, you know, how can we invest um, in the future right here, right now? How can we, something that, that's been, that I've been thinking more about is how can I begin to be a good ancestor for the generations that can, that can come after me, right? That starts with us opening up space in a democratic manner, opening up space and beginning to build the new thing and beginning to develop new social values, new social relations that are collaborative, communal, uh, cooperative, creative, imaginative, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, adaptive and flexible and dynamic, right? That That is what we have to look at. We have to think, hopefully, what are the possibilities Let's look at what we have around us. There's so much that we can start do that, that we can start doing, excuse me, right now. You know, people say that we don't have the, the time, 
or the energy or the or the resources it's, it's bullshit there are going to be sacrifices that are going to have to be made it's going to be hard it's going to be difficult right and and we're it, you know we are being called to sacrifice the, the whatever it is that's holding us back we are being called to relinquish our chains physical psychological spiritual in in order to build the new world the the new system in order to create a liberated society because the 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 liberatory process is about making a new humanity right that's what we are being called to and so we're going to have to sacrifice things and we're going to have to change uh, uh, uh our lifestyles and we're going to have to give up you know creature comforts right we're going to have to give those things up but it's in service to something that's 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 so incredible right which is a, a, a new humanity an, another start another chance we still have a chance to end on a different note humanity's narrative the, the narrative and the story of humanity does not have to simply be one long stretch of domination and conquest and and violence and exploitation and dehumanization we have a chance to end on another note, to end on a note of humanization, to end on a note of solidarity and community and, and really love. We have we have a chance to do something new. We can change the story and we can do that right now. We can start doing that right now. All we need is the will and the imagination. And so that's what I will hope that, that that's um, what I what I see the role of BSA as being and moneyless society and, and Ron's role with, with TikTok and um, is that we are trying to open up the imagination, open up the will to hope. So yeah, that's my spiel. And I would just say like none of these things that Demetrius just said or um, what Marlo was saying, like these things don't have to be taboo or like fringe you know like these can be <clears throat> like common ideologies um like because i notice with people <laughs> when you when you uh start proposing solutions to the problems that plague us all i mean we you'll you'll hear them uh you know complain about certain aspects of society and you offer solutions and all you receive is uh pushback and doubt and criticism it's like where is all this you know like skepticism when it comes to the very system that that you live in like um as you clearly you clearly don't seek uh solutions as much as like you say you desire so I, that, that's um that's something i think is important like we have to like really want it as much as like we in my opinion pretend to to want it you know um and it's it's not like like I said, yeah, it doesn't have to be anything uh, out of this world. Like these things, um, like we've been saying, these are like ancestral ideologies. These predate any of uh, the so-called um, like theories and you know, propositions that like we're all uh, dealing with in the modern day. It, it's, it's just a, a, a remembering that has to take place. There's um, no special process, no, you know, fancy dancy fancy schmancy i don't know self-help you know revelations that you need to have you know just like like demetrius is saying i have hope have faith um and uh i'm no christian but the bible um has a very poignant quote it's saying like faith without works is dead you can't just uh blindly that, that that's what's led us here is a uh, blind faith in certain institutions like you have to have faith and then you have to um validate that faith with um, the work you put in and you know the the energy that you divert towards you know li liberatory endeavors and who do, I mean at the end of the day who doesn't want liberation and then yeah it's our people that should want it the most and I, I, I want that for us like I, I, I want um, I want us to want it you know because we should want nothing more we deserve nothing more
We all deserve everything we need to live our best life. And none of us can truly reach our potential till everyone else in our ecosystem has what they need to reach their potential. If you want to support Black Socialists in America or Moneyless Society, for real, you can start by helping our own Ron get closer to the life he deserves. He had to record that episode at Starbucks because he and his girlfriend are currently living out of their sedan. He was hesitant to put this out there, but I reminded him, as someone who has been in that situation and many others, I know now that pride isn't suffering in silence, but loving yourself enough to ask for the help you need. So they've created a GoFundMe, which I'll link in the description, to raise funds for a camper or an RV with a solar setup, wireless hotspot, and the things that they need to create and to spread the revolutionary message that this young comrade is just pumping out every time he can. But, but can't because he's limited. So if you want that great content, <laughs> you're going to have to help him out, to help yourself out. Plain and simple, I fucking love Ron. He's an absolutely brilliant young mind, way beyond where any of us were at his age. And he's a good person who really cares. He's created so much with so little, he obviously deserves better. Let's help him get where he can help others better and put into practice all this philosophy to start creating the mutually reinforcing positive feedback loop that will come back to help us on our revolutionary journey. As always, thanks to our patrons. If you want to support us or BSA, please do and check out our content and our websites and get involved to actually start building this struggle because this is it. We can't, we gotta, we talk enough, okay? We need to start doing things. Starting with this young black revolutionary and his partner living out of their damn car. Come on. Let's come together as a community and show them we know what mutual aid means. Power to the people. So if a technologically advanced society in which everyone's basic needs are met and all life is valued and respected sounds like a cult, then what does this sound like? Everyone on the face of the planet participating in a giant game of monopoly in which they work for the benefit of a few men every day in order to acquire pieces of paper that literally have no value outside of what we assign to it, in order to be allowed access to life's necessities that literally come from the earth that we did. But you gotta get to work somehow, right? So everyone has these motorized boxes on four wheels in which you virtually can't live without, and they're powered by a finite resource that's extracted from the planet. And then after you spend most of your day trading time and labor for numbers, you take your motorized box back to the comfort of your own home while millions of others spend the night without one because you earned it and they didn't.